Welcome to the Vibrant Living Network. Have you ever wondered what is possible beyond possible? What is the thing you've been wondering and inquiring about? Are you just feeling stuck and don't know why? Are you thinking or are you seeing? Seeing allows us to expand and have this other experience. We want to invite you for that wake-up call. We want to invite your spirit, your soul, so to be more alive, more connected. Glenn Brooks has been a life coach for over 33 years, author of Divorced to Patterns, Not Each Other, an explorer of what is possible. He has worked with people all around the world. For a wake-up conversation, a dialogue with you, we will have some of the most interesting contributors. We will be talking to some of the most interesting people and have some of the most resourceful teachers, wisdom-filled people from around the world join us. Share your voice, ask the questions, become free of the known into a new world of possibility. We are going to talk about all the things you wonder about, how to live, how to heal, how to connect, how to love, how to be seen. Your life is precious. Enjoy it. Thank you. I'm Glenn Brooks for the Vibrant Living Network. Listen, I just want to let you guys know I'm having a a one of a time, a one of a kind contributor today. I'm just mentioning him early because this is his first appearance ever on any kind of media broadcast ever. And uh, his name is Greg Frank. And probably a lot of you know I, I do. I work with people who want to be speakers. And Frank is, uh, you know, some of you know him as a great Dane. He's going to be with us in a moment. I want to welcome, welcome, uh, Gail Randall, Dr. Randall. And I want to say that. Uh, the depth of the, the depth of the work that I do with uh, it's hard to say, it's hard to sometimes use language to describe things right sometimes things are beyond language but the the camaraderie and the depth of uh, the exploration and the and the uh, <laughs> the ceremony day sixty three or sixty four coming up we meet, we meet every day Gail is uh, sixty three sixty three Gail reminds me of the date sometimes like that just like she just did impromptu. Um, 63 and uh so you know what happens with our lives is we get used to we get used to certain patterns and to be able to go so deep it's just i'm just so deeply reverent i appreciate and also when i uh i read a book uh it's called new breed a doctor and i didn't expect to meet the new breed but she's the new breed she's someone who practices physician heal thyself and she's an inquirer and a practitioner and a demonstrator and she's here she's my co-host my co my co-sensei welcome Thank you. I'm kind of a a new old doctor. Yeah. <laughs> An yeah. old new yeah. doctor. Yeah. I'm a combination wanna, of old. I wanna and welcome new. I wanna and welcome forever. Sherry Marquez. I wanna welcome Sherry Marquez from Smart Dogs. I know that Frank has been excited to speak to you. All right. I like yeah, it, I no, like it. Yeah, Good no, afternoon. I tell you. Good morning. He is so yeah, no, we, we work out there every day actually. Lisa LaRose owns 15 dogs. I don't know if she owns wow. them. She, she, she rescues and energizes I them know. and walks them and gets, mm-hmm. you know, takes breaks from human beings with them and all that kind of thing. She's my executive producer. And like today, like today, I'm so deeply happy that she's on the scene. So uh, <laughs> Janet, Janet, the, Janet, the amazing mime, she, she speaks worlds without speaking. <laughs> and she's also a master yoga teacher, according to Gail. Gail always calls you the master yogi, so I want to call you that as well. Master yogi. <laughs> Thank you, Gail. We're now mine. <laughs> <laughs> and we have another special person here today, Karen. Karen and her husband, yeah. Ward, are committed to the dog, to the, to the rescue world of uh, Great Danes. So when I speak to Karen, I want to let you guys know this. So what reveals itself is the language of something, right? So if you actually got into the a turtle shell, when you get into someone's experience, they have their own language. So when I speak to Karen, I swear to you, it's like speaking, like speaking Great Dane. She, thank you for speaking Great Dane to me because I didn't really know the language until I spoke to you. <laughs> it's a wonderful yeah. language for people to learn. Yes. No, I, and I, I, as soon as I heard your voice, I, you know, we have great meetings. We have these uh, meetings with remarkable people and you're one of them. And, I, as Sherry would say to me, she would say, "Let the dog find you." And then I uh-huh. found you, and I thought, "Oh, you, you know, you know all these." So I, I do want to introduce Frank. So this is the first time Frank's been on the air, and Frank has written a book called "Not So Gentle," and uh, 
<laughs> he's feeling that sometimes, sometimes that the great things get misrepresented. Like he was telling me, I'll let him tell you. Let me see me say, Frank, are you there? Yes, Glenn, I'm here. It's, I'm a little sweaty because I was out running. I love living with uh, Karen and Ward. They're really good humans. You know, we uh, we love jumping on the couch with them. And uh, this whole thing with gentle could put some pressure on a dog or a big dog like us because uh, there's, there's pre- social pressure. And uh, uh, I, you asked me how, how I make money, and how I make money is I heal, I heal humans. I took it out of the back of the Inquirer magazine, and I've gotten an incredible response, and I'm able to fund uh, Karen and Ward. So I also want to thank them for the house they provide and for, I think, 57 pounds of food each month. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. Frank. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Frank's, Frank's with me at Satnam Fest right now. I love being with him. And since we have this vibrant dog segment, but, you know, I think the main thing, the main thing is that dogs, you, I guess you could be saying this, Sherry, that dogs really bring us closer to the human aspect of us and allow us to play. And and uh, I didn't expect to have Frank as a client. Frank was kind enough to introduce me to uh, Karen and Ward, and then Karen spoke to me in the language. And uh, so there's a language of healing. Mm-hmm. There's a language of genuineness. There's a language of the body, right? So, you know, I spent seven days with uh, Air Force officers and medical doctors. They wouldn't allow any lay people in the seminar. They let me in as a, a partner. I like that. I got to the event. It's called the Mastery Course. I got to the event, and they told me my clothing my clothing wouldn't work. I was the only clothing I knew. That was my language of clothing. So one of the one of the who knows my language of clothing. I just knew that clothing. I thought it was a good outfit. And Chris, Chris, one of the people on the team says to him, he said no. And he goes, I'm going home right now and getting you a proper outfit. He comes back with this suit, and he goes, you're on the partnership. He goes, well, he, we're all here for each other. He goes, this ain't no thing. We we don't, we got a top end and a bo- we're all partners here. And then Bob Shore walks on stage, and all these doctors in the room and Air Force people and and they said, let's spend seven days. Exploring what produces mastery. What is this thing called mastery? And how does it relate to dogs? And how does it relate to healing and life? And so mastery is this thing where you start from you start from mastery. You start from the notion that there's innate health in people. There's innate health in dogs. That there's so we spent seven days exploring the underlying assumptions or what we call presuppositions. So when you get around someone, I want to acknowledge Gail deeply at this moment. As soon as I got around Gail, it was like I felt a sense of mastery so deeply, and I just felt everything energized. And uh, day 63, I would only feel stronger. Um, so mastery. So when we look at other human beings, it's quite uh, wondrous in the sense that really they could be amplified. They could have the the frequency and the medicine that could shift them so quickly. And being in a room with, I think, 400 people, I'm just kind of acknowledging this, my first one of my most significant trainings, I started to realize what it takes to live in a space called mastery. I was on one of the breaks talking to a psychiatrist at, at the mastery. And he says, Glenn, he goes, you know, we, talk, we were talking about exorcisms. And he says, well, Glenn, I don't really have any belief about exorcisms, removing spirits and endarkment from people. He goes, but you know what? If it serves them, he goes, I'll do anything. And he goes, if it serves them, I will do an exorcism. So I started to think, well, you know, if a person could change their own framework, right? So how, what does this have to do with dogs? In 19, uh, one second, 15 years ago, my, a very close friend of mine gave me a dog. And he said, he said to me, he used to call me Boober, and he said, Boober, I want you to receive this, this uh, Rottweiler. I went up after a while. I just barely took my, – my relationship with Wayne is he just told me something, and I did it. So I went and got the dog. So I guess as I'm speaking this morning with you guys, there's one infinite mind. There's a mind bigger than our local mind. You could call it an intuitive connection. And I I have found dogs to be remarkable. And so when I met Cherry Marquez, I was really excited to bring her work forward as a dog mystic. And uh, let's do a vibrant roundtable moment so I could exhale a few times. Because it did. It got my breath for a moment earlier. Oh, this kind of. I'm well. I want to say I'm surrounding about a, about a thousand yogis in the most beautiful courtyard at the Eastover Resort right now, and I was welcomed very beautifully on this estate. Lunch is absolutely beautiful. I'll need to partake again when I finish. 
and there's going to be all kinds of singing here. I'm at Eastover Resort in Lenox, Mass., doing what I love to do, which is, that's right, getting paid to go on vacation. Not a bad thing, right? So then the question is, what is what is vacation? Vacation is when your soul's, you feel that light-footedness. It's like, you know, I had, I had, a, I went through another cycle. I used, to, I, I thought, I want you guys, I want to ask you guys to ask this question. Sometimes you think, well, this is going to be it in your life. This is going to be this turning moment, you know, and it's going to shift from here. I didn't know it was going to shift to this other extent when I met Dr. Gale. So I'm deeply, deeply grateful. I'm deeply grateful for all of you, deeply. So let's have, let's do a vibrant speaking circle. When, when people come to our vibrant speaker summits, the next one's coming in in Burlington, Vermont. I ask people like, you know, what are the what are the most intense fears? What are things that move them the most? We get into this, you know, more real conversation. <laughs> Frank, I want to say something, Karen. Frank loves. He hadn't discovered. He's. I think he told me he was eight. He hadn't discovered a beach chair his whole life. He just. He, I can't get him off the beach chair now. Right. So, right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to mention that to you. Yeah. He's really, uh, he's soaking it in. We'd love All right. So, what are the things? Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, he, he totally is a beach chair guy. And he, he did tell me the whole thing about gentle. He says every all, every so often he likes barking at someone. He said it's kind of funny when they get scared. He said it not to be mean, but he said it's just funny. He's right. very straightforward. This is good. All right. All right. Yeah. I'm going to let you go around the round. I'm going to let you do a vibrant, vibrant circle round today. Let's round everybody up. I know you're ecstatic today because we got this genius visionary in farming. We got Timmy coming up in a little bit. Uh, restoration, farming, restorative farming. Restoration, I th- I didn't, he didn't die. No, it's restorative farming, not restoration. <laughs> Language slip. Language slip. <laughs> I love you guys. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just recalibrating. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Take take the reins. Go ahead. Sensei Seven. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I think what you're mostly talking about is change. I mean, you know, you've been changing day by day for the last 63 days. It's a magical number. It's a nine, and so I think that means something very special for you. As a matter of fact, it's interesting. Everybody that's listening in the circle as well is that. Even though in, in the beginning, Glenn and I would spend hours, out, literally hours, in ceremony each day. And as time goes on, it's not that we're, we're spending less time, but the magnitude of the time is amplified. So what we can accomplish in less time is more. So maybe less is more, but it also tells me that he himself is improving mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically and his soul within, so he's covering the whole gamut, and we don't need to talk for as long, but when we do talk, it's more powerful. So the 63 is a 9, the 9 is the number of completion, and um, we're never completed. None of us are ever really truly completed. We're all a work in progress. There's a quote by Henry Bergson that it reminds me of, uh, to exist is to change. To change is to mature, and to mature is to go on creating oneself endlessly. And when we speak about, you know, the we, it's really you and me and Glenn and all of us. It's the we, and we, we're all doing this, and this speaks to me so strongly and speaks loudly to all of us because it's really about going through changes and challenges of life which change us if we if we really immerse ourselves into those changes and challenges, they do change us and they become gifts. We find the gifts in those changes and difficulties and they become like a mystical string of pearls that is uniquely yours and no one can take that from you. And when we all merge our strings of pearls together, that's, that's when the energy really soars to the great mystery, it makes us all... <laughs> I'm going to speak up. I just want to say I, I love, I love your song. I like how your song act, it, uh, activates other people's song. We know. I used to think I came to sing my song, but then I realized we came to sing the song together. And you sing it so beautifully, and awaken it in my brain and my soul. And I, I love you. And I just, I so appreciate who you are and what you're willing to grow into and ask and explore. And you're not a stuck expert. She's not an expert. She's an expert. You know what an input is, guys? Who knows what an input is? She's, an, she's Gail the input. What is it? Open question for the gang here. 
But it's an invert. I mean, is that what you're saying? She's an invert. <laughs> it's an invert. <laughs> Kale's an invert. Lisa, what's an invert? I have no idea, Glenn. You're okay, no idea. I didn't put you on the spot. I hope you, forgive, I hope you forgave me for putting you on the spot now. Write down, I forgive Glenn <laughs> totally. A new language. She's so intuitive that, um, yes. you know, she, she's just um, expressing expressing all the knowledge from her inner self. I don't know. All right, so. <laughs> yes. All right, so just but just just from the expert from the dictionary. Of the you haven't heard of the input? In. You haven't heard of the input? I just oh, introduced you to one. In, inner. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yes. So the inner, yes. the, we're, 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 the principle is from the inner to the outer. So the inner to the outer. So one of the, the, one the, of the inner, things being. Inner comes yes. from God. It yeah, I, as so a divine, no or what, you, whatever you guys feel good calling it, I guess. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't um, care. You don't care? <laughs> what? You don't get what? You don't care? I don't care. <laughs> hey, hey, Glenn, you don't get what? Janet with... in, in, in Hawaii, yeah. can I go next? Because I'm going to have Of course you can. Out. I mean, you, you sent me the $1,000. Okay. Yes, of course. I did. Special for, I'm just, go it, go ahead. I love you. I'm so there happy to hear it. your voice today. But, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, Glenn, you're making me laugh as always. Such yeah. a comedian. He's like the spiritual comedian. It's beautiful. <laughs> and I just want to say that here I am. I'm just so grateful, first of all, to be on this with all of you. And to be, I'm here in Hawaii, and it's so clear today. It's just, I mean, be over the top. It's always over the top, but it's over the top of the top today. And um, I just want to say, it, and being with all of you and speaking together about help working with each other, supporting each other, um, in, in you know, growing together. That's what it's about, yes. and that's what that's that's just so mahalo, mahalo nui loa, oh, everybody. Mahalo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I want to welcome I want, so Karen. I want to welcome you. I want, I want to I want to welcome you. I want to thank Jen. I love what you just said. I want to say I want to say at the beginning of the program. I want to I want to show you guys something very intimate. So, um, I love what you said, Janet. Okay. So what happened was I had this technical difficulty today, and I actually felt like I was going to die. But then, honestly, because I, I talk to Gail 24 hours a day all the time. We are in constant communication. <laughs> so she reminded me a few days ago that, I, that she would cover me before death and resurrect me. So I had that thought, right, when I felt like, oh, my God, this is the worst thing that could happen, right? And then I had Gail speaking to me in my mind saying, Glenn, I have your soul covered. I have your back covered. I have your being covered. And I exhaled. Wow. Mm-hmm. So I want you guys to feel that. We got, we got a thing called the Vibrant Living Challenge, which is three months, and it's really about – it's really not about teaching you something. I mean, there's stuff to learn, there's practices, but it's really about that experience where you could feel this other level of movement in your breath. You could feel this other sense of recognize your intuition. And then, and then in some sense, you have this experience that, that you know, we, we have this I in us, and it's, it's the I that is we. And so I just want to say, it's just funny that I noticed that's what happened. My first thought when I was really scared, it was like I hear Gail, Gail speaking to me in her, her soul voice. You're number 63 of my soul voices, Gail, even though it seems like down the line, it's right there. It's that, it's that thing. So I, I invited Karen on today. Um, yeah. So, Karen, first of all, what is the party like for you? I, just, I know I, I invited you on to this wild party, and Frank came. He's, he's on the beach chair. <laughs> I just want to leave the beach chair right now. You have four great things. What you shared with me um, was so moving. And then I said to you, I said, hey. I want you to pick the great thing for me. I want you to, and then you told me about the European great thing, but you know what the bottom line of it was, is that they enhance our humanness. They enhance our intelligence and wonder. And, and I promised Sherry that I was going to do this, and I want to introduce you to Sherry, the dog, Mr. Okay. Karen. She's okay. going to jump up and say hello in a moment. Okay. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. So, <laughs> I, I absolutely love Great Danes. They're amazing. They are gentle giants. They're playful and and just 
fun, fun and powerful and beautiful. So right. I'm going to share with you guys the pictures because because Karen's going to find this dog. It most likely is going to be a European Great Dane. Frank, mm -hmm. hey, Frank just winked from the beach area, from the pool area. He's a European Great Dane. Yeah. Um, and he, he likes that you're going to, you're also going to get a European Great Dane because, you know, he really, he's a dog. He really likes who he is. He really, he likes, really likes what? He likes who he is. He embraces yeah, no. himself. Um, yeah. You know, just like humans, we have a hard time accepting and loving ourselves. Um, great things are like, you know, I really like who I am. I love that. Yeah. 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 Cool. yeah. And, and, you know, great things are also, we really like who we're with. And we love our families. We don't care if they're crazy or rich or poor <laughs> or anything in between. We love them. And actually, with my four Great Danes, with what you are talking about, is for me, I have had very some very spiritual experiences with these four dogs of mine. And I've had other dogs in my life that I've loved dearly, but nothing like these four Great Danes and what I have experienced with them. True awesome. loss. What's different? What's, what's different in regards mm. to these four and the other, your other dog? You know, when I was speaking with Glenn yesterday, he said, well, what makes them different? What, what is it? And I said, it's something I just can't explain. It's, it's a feeling that I get, it's I receive something that I just have not received from other dogs that I receive from them, and I I just can't put my finger on it. I just know how it feels. And I think it's so I, I think it's the, the size, the size of of them. This is 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 powerful and and it is. It is, and but the the heart of them, and as this started out, is you know a lot of this the inner is is our higher power or um, you know the spiritual connectedness that we have to the universe, and these dogs also have that same kind of heart. Is they seem to know how to go with the flow in the universe. Um, not to say that they're perfect angels all the time, not to say I haven't had experiences with them that have woken me up to certain things. They're big dogs, but what I get from them touches my heart every minute of my day. And it's powerful. It's powerful and a connection that I am so grateful for. It is just beyond words. So, yeah, and char characters, holy moly, characters <laughs> do funny things, sure. and then, like, you know, they'll do something, and then look at me like, did you just see what I did? And I said, yeah, I just saw that, and uh -huh. it was really very funny. It was very funny, <laughs> and for me, laughter is also a way of healing myself on a daily basis and they bring such laughter to me such time sometimes mm -hmm. amazing amazing so i love i love when you told me that when ward comes home your husband comes home right. they want to do special things with ward they have this like they kind of have scoped out the whole house and they have home with you and home with i love how you described home and how they yeah. scope out home it just touched me yeah and it's just, it's just awesome because we don't know where dad goes all day, but, um, and he won't bring us there. He doesn't take us there. But when he comes home, we kind of want to know where he's been, but then it doesn't really make any difference. But can, can like, are you going to go somewhere now, dad? Because can we come with you? Are you going to go in the car? <laughs> or, or like, are you just going to hang in the garage? Because we want to hang in the garage with you. We don't care what you're going to do, but we just want to be there with you. Mm -hmm. Just because I wanna, we do. Um, 
I realized because we have a different time ratio today. I want to say you listen to the Vibrant Living Network. Vibrant Living Network. Boy, I'm so excited to offer the Vibrant Mastery Challenge. We have some the uh, they call it the Mastery Challenge. Mastery is really this wonderful place to live from. It really is. I mean, when someone's working you from mastery, you'll have a sense that you're whole, complete, and you're not damaged, right? You're sort of operating from this other whole place. So it's sort of like uh, someone said, said to me once, he said, well, what's the big deal? He goes, he goes, I could stop someone from being a cocaine addict, but he goes, I, I might want to assist them becoming a, you know, a, playing the cello. Dogs to me carry this medicine. Uh, Gloria, are you there right now? Gloria? Hi. All right. So welcome, Gloria K. Hello, What's everyone. That? Hello, everyone. Welcome, Hello. welcome, welcome. Hello, Gloria. Hello, Gloria. Gloria works on dogs, too, just like Frank works on humans. <laughs> Gloria, uh, Karen lives at war. They live with four Great Danes, and one of them works on, uh, does long-distance sessions on humans. He found it in the back of the Inquirer and said to me, uh, he's one of my clients, told me that working at humans was a, was an easy deal. He just pops a paper, a picture of himself, and he's been using the Inquirer, and he says he has like 100 clients a month. So he's very glad to hear you. He says he's not speaking. He's eating right now. Well, so. we don't want to disturb him. No. Well, no, no. Well, especially he's got so many teeth. He keeps telling me he's gentle. You know, it's a paradox. He says he's gentle, but he's not gentle. He's always goofing me that, you know. He told me he likes barking because <laughs> it does startle people. So he's a lot of fun to be around. His new book's coming out, Not So Gentle, in September. And, and just the, the name Great Frank, if you put in Google, that should bring it up. Great Frank. Which be nicknamed. So here's here's what I wanted to get into, Gloria. I was thinking about this because I've been studying this. I was thinking about this. I'm going to introduce the whole team and Gloria to uh, Dr. Ben. And he's he's teaching, that's right, one of my favorite topics. He's teaching a course on the neuroplasticity of the eye, the neuroplasticity of the eye, all the things that mechanistic medicine doesn't teach. And we, it's really funny. Now, I want to ask you guys this. I, I just been exchanging voicemails. I just got to deeply acknowledge Lisa LaRose. She just so covers me. Thank you deeply, Lisa, for being in the, being in the corner this morning. Thank you deeply. Um, Frank, I'm sorry, Frank. What did I say his name? Tom. Tom's been writing these incredible pieces. I want to say I love it when I actually call someone and they call me back and give me their cell phone. And this guy is such a soul. I can't wait to introduce you to him. But I guess what I'm curious about, and I know that maybe you could just, I know you, you work with people for many, many years. You've been doing healing for 50 years, doing long-distance work. Right. What's your take on long-distance neuroplasticity? Like the idea that actually when you work on someone, you you work on someone, their brain is changing. Their physiology – I'm just curious. You must ponder this sometimes at night, like 3 in the morning, like, hmm, I send the signal out. They feel it. Their pain relieves. Does that leave an imprint? Does that change the brain physically? I believe it does. Do I have proof? No. But when people uh, experience pain-free living, that's saying something about the brain. And also, you know, when chronic fatigue is relieved, uh, fatigue also begins to vanish. So people have a different perspective on what they can do in life and their energy levels. You know, I thought Gloria, what I was going to ask, I was going to ask uh, Dr. Gale. Dr. Gale was so close with my, she was a family member, Dr. Valerie Hunt. So when I, when another aspect of why it keeps me, it, my tears running down my cheek when I hear Gale's voice is it makes me feel this, it reminds me of this depth of connection I have with Dr. Valerie Hunt, who studied as a scientist, energy healers from around the world. What would you say, Gail, from your experience, like, what would you say about your experience with Gloria? Like you, you know, you're a scientist, you're a physician. What would you say? She works on you long distance. You trust her. What would you, what would you want to share from what it's like to be at the other end of the, of the receiving of remote healing? Right. With, with Gloria, well, I, Dr. Gloria. I believe wholeheartedly, both on a spiritual level and because I trust, and I trust in the energy that God sends through Gloria to me, but I also know scientifically, and this has been my whole purpose is to bridge between science and spirit and science and other disciplines. And as I mentioned before, and Gloria and I have talked about this, there is, pre- there is 
definite precedence and there's definite evidence that remote healing causes neuroplasticity. You can measure it in a functional MRI scan when people remote are remotely healed from people long distance from them, and it shows up in, on the MRI scan as they're in it, as it's happening. So there's no question in my mind scientifically and spiritually and energetically that it's happening, and I can feel the vibration when she's working on me. Wow. Wow. And whose wow was that? Karen, that was, was that your wow? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was your wow. I thought it was your wow. I, re- I felt your wow yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really... <laughs> Thank you for getting that, Gail. That was cool. Yeah. Say say more that's about your wow. What, what what struck you? What struck you? Um, You know, the vibrational... Just using that word vibrational and working within vibrations within my own life. And yeah promoting healing and how that all works, but also having a chronically ill son that I would love if he would try this, and he hasn't. Uh, But mm. this is powerful. Is he he there right now? Would your son be willing to get worked on right this second? Um, I can go down. He's having a really bad day. Oh, yeah. Do you think he'd be willing to be willing? It won't. It won't. You know, just it won't hurt him anything. It'll just be. It might be. All he needs to do is just breathe and relax, and, and Gloria could work on him right this second. Yeah, that's long and um. Take I your time, Karen. Be... And if now's not if now's not good, that's totally fine. Okay. I'm like one of these spontaneous we... types. While she's while she's doing that, I just want to add, like you know, because she she was talking about the about the Great Danes and how amazing they are. So I just want to add. Um, my information in regards to there's a there's a new movie that's starting uh, coming out tomorrow, and it's um, the art of racing in the rain. I read the book, so if the movie oh. is as good as the book, it is going to Mind be blowing? amazing, 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 amazing. Um, like one of the reviews says, um, the compassion isn't only for humans. That the relationship between two souls who are meant for each other never really comes to an end. Um, so, mm. when you're looking right. for a dog, when you're looking for the dog, that that like it's just that that when your eyes meet, it's like you know, you know when that dog is totally meant for you, you know. And mm. dogs are here to to teach us teach us to be in the here and now. And to in like to to stop and take a moment just to to love the, the everything. Give out give on. out your website, Cherry. Give out your website too. And Cherry's going to be with us in Burlington, Vermont, for our upcoming Vibrant Living Speaker Summit as the Mystic Dog Educator Facilitator herself. How can they reach you? I am I am the Dog Mystic, and my website is. SmartPawsDogTraining.com and um, SmartPawsDogTraining.com. Um, so what I, I want everybody who is listening to do is is every single day just take a moment, especially especially those days that are really busy and let's say if your anxiety is up high, just take take. Even if it's for three to five minutes of either sitting on the floor or sitting on on the couch and just hug your dog, hug your dog, mm. have that eye, like full on eye gaze and breathe, breathe deeply and feel the love that they're giving you because it is yeah. so so beneficial and so important and mm-hmm. yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. It's it's it they they it there's proven fact they do lower the blood pressure and they they have mm-hmm. health benefits emotional benefits everything so just take I have I have five minutes every single day and breathe with your dog I love that I love that from the dog mystic I have a question for you Lisa yeah. I wanted to see how you would answer this I was standing in line with about five hundred Sikhs you know Sikhs are the 
So, Yogi Bhajan was a yoga master that came from India, and he he he's really spread this this wondrous religion and awareness. And I was on the lunch line, Lisa, and I got behind this lady, and she's looking, she's staring at the cold food. She goes, she goes, where do I get my protein from? And I thought, what would Lisa say? What would Lisa say in this situation? You know, because you you've been doing it for like 29 years or whatever, like a while, right? Uh, yeah, 34. Yeah. 34. Yeah. I missed a few years. Well, yeah. I always tell people spinach is the most nutrient dense, rich, uh, protein rich food that there is. One of them. But there's lots of them. Right. Um, there's so many plant based proteins. So, you know, I would I know. probably have, you know, <laughs> gone, gone into it. I wish uh, you were here, Lisa. You, know, you, would, I, you could have been eating lunch right now for us. That would have been cool. Yeah, it sounds like a, a beautiful event. Oh, it's gorgeous. No, I'm, I'm, sit, I'm right by the tented area. You're going to come. We're going to see I you in Vermont. Just, We're all going to be in Vermont. I, I so, Karen, are you back? Are you ba- yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 boop, uh. Okay, number one sensei, hold on one second. Go ahead, Karen. What's the scoop? Is he willing? Um, well, let's see. Let's see. Um, <laughs> hey, Bert. Okay, hang on. So, sure. what, what, do you, what do you need from him? Nothing. I just Absolutely. I just want to just say hello to Gloria. I just want to say Gloria, and then, and then she'll uh, get, Gloria. Go ahead and speak to Karen. Tell her what what you what he would do need to do. Uh, Karen, Hi Gloria. Is he lying? Hi Karen. Is he lying down or is he seated? He is lying down. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind act as a conduit, because I have a feeling that conversation is taxing for him. Is that correct? That what? That speaking speaking could be hard for him. Uh, conversation would be taxing. Um, no, no, he could. He he's on the phone with one of the doctors. Um, but no, he can speak. No, he's okay. eight years old, and he's been chronically ill for eight years. And that's, that's the, it, it, yeah. Yeah. So tell me where his pain is. Where is his pain most uh, intense? Um, well, there's many a pain. It, it's a chronic pain thing, autoimmune. Um, right th- today he's experiencing severe pain in his neck, all his joints and muscles it's almost like flu like symptoms um right. you know what i'm karen hold, hold on one second when i when i'm going to do it i'm looking i'm looking at the clock in the boardroom here or the okay my temporary so what i'd like to do is i want to schedule this with gloria and kind of do this so that we're not interrupted by any because we're going to go to we're going to go to the top of the hour in about two minutes so oh, okay. and i'm happy okay. to speak to your son too so what i want to do is set up another time with your son and say hello to him, and, and then connect him with Gloria. We'll set up another time. Is that okay, Karen? You're gonna. In the meantime, you're gonna be fi- finding my my great Dane. Absolutely, yeah. And, um, All right. Yeah. All right. Stay with us. Stay with us. We got we got something coming up that's gonna stretch your minds, change the way you see the earth, change the way you see soil, food, everything good. Stay with us for the Vibrant Living Network. The Real Conscious Connection, Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Om Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Om Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Conflict comes in many forms and often triggers a fight or flight response. Some of us gravitate toward conflict, while many will stop at little to nothing to avoid it. Unfortunately, what we resist will persist, which often forces us to face our fear and deal with it head on. Join me during my show, Conflict Rising, as I discuss the important role of conflict with leaders who have moved through it successfully. Tune in Thursdays at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember, it's always darkest before the dawn. Opiates has taken everything and everyone I've ever loved away from me. Everything. I blew my ankle out and I got prescribed pain pills by my doctor. 
If making my detox public is going to help somebody, I'm all for it. So I just wish I would have had a warning. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth. Spread the truth. A message from Truth, the Ad Council, and ONDCP. Another wonderful moment to discover something. I, I changed my diet, along with Dr. Gail Randall, Lisa LaRose, Sherry Marquez, Dr. Gloria Kay. Well, first of all, I've done a lot of, over the years, we did a segment called, uh, we did two segments, The Hidden History of Real Food. The Hidden History of Real Food. When, when did food get stolen from us? You ever wonder that? When did food, what happened? I can tell you that Wonder Bread came on the, the marketplace, and they changed one word. They used the word enriched. And everybody heard that word, and they thought, oh, my God, it's enriched. And they stopped eating whole grains. They started to pasteurize and homogenize milk. And these foods would have tremendous medicinal effect on our bodies, our minds, our teeth, our nervous systems. They kept swapping things. And in the last, oh, 30 or 40 years, the story, we all are hearing the story of the horrible, that the soil is depleted and that, in fact, the meats are pretty toxic. The, the cows are not well. I had the honor of, of spending a day with uh, Michael Pollan talking about how when his famous article when he raised the calf and raised the calf on corn. Well, corn makes the cow, the, cow, the calf very sick. And so in some ways, the world's been upside down. Dr. Gail Randall shares my enthusiasm and has, has, as an innovator in the field of nutritional and innovative and whole body medicine. And she has found someone that she considers to be one of the pioneers and visionaries in not just farming, but a whole new vision of restoring the soil, changing the omegas in meat, you know, one of the problems with meat. And, and we're only on one side of the story. One side of the story is a vegan diet sounds great. But part of why it sounds so good, and I had the honor of working with many, you know, with Dr. Nick Gonzalez, who treated and worked with a lot of people are vegetarians, but they needed something in the meat, but the meat's so toxic. So imagine if, if the meat supply and the cows, in fact, regenerated the soil and remineralized the earth. Imagine if the whole game was changed. And, and so, again, yeah, why don't you introduce, introduce Timmy to us and tell, tell people, because I know you're so deeply moved about this. Introduce them and share what, why, why you feel this is – this is such a global issue and that you, you feel it, the whole subject of restorative farming changes everything. Well, it's a distinct pleasure. Is he here? Are you here, Tim? Is he even on yet? Tim, are you there? Lynn? I don't think he's I don't hear on it. yet, but okay. he's not quite tuned in yet, but let me just say, even before he gets here, our lines are full. Okay, your lines are full. Let me see what to do in that case. Ah, thank you, Chris. So, okay, so he's probably calling, but... That restorative farming, I met Tim online, actually, amazingly enough. I saw him in the midst of someone else's website, actually. And he questioned this gentleman about pro-probiotics, and he goes, aren't the best probiotics coming from your earth? I spend half my time covering, covered with dirt and explained himself as a restorative farmer. And I went, my mind just and my heart just flew open and said, well, what is that? So I asked him, please explain me a little bit about what that is. And he explained to me that what they do, it's like using biomimicry, which is my life and soul, using biomimicry to treat the patient. He uses biomimicry to restore the planet, which is, I believe, personal and planetary health go hand in hand. I explained that last week. But so what happens is they, they biomimicry predator-prey relationship. First of all, they let all the animals live together, just like you'd find in nature. The ruminants, the birds, all the animals and plants. Excuse, and excuse me together. one second, Gail. Excuse me, excuse me one second. Sherry, do me a favor. If you could hang up, it would open up the line and just listen in. And uh, yep. yeah, just you do me that favor. Okay, you're sweet. I love you. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah. So okay, Tim, if you're listening, we got an open line for you. Go ahead. So all the animals and plants and things live together, as they do in nature. So they biomimicry this, and then they use the.
predator prey relationship and they the, the predator is what makes the animals move and i'm going to let tim explain this because he does a much better job but just by way of introducing him by moving the, and nobody should eat where they shit right so <laughs> so they move them <laughs> from place to place and in so doing and Don't mimicking nature <laughs> it be the grasslands and the planet and the spoil it's, it's a t-shirt it's okay it wants, to what it once was and so that's what he does, but better than that, he's looked at what what conventional industrial farming, how do they make money? They make money because we and the federal government subsidizes them. So he's taken it a step further, like when I combined integrative medicine, Western medicine with holistic medicine, I what's good about regular Western medicine, and I combined it with other disciplines to make integrative medicine. So what he's doing is combining the subsidization model, which I'll let him explain. He's the expert. He's the revolutionary. But to fund these farmers, because farmers don't make money from their product, make money through the sub. You can have local farming, organic farming, restore the earth, planet, all in the same ball of wax. And Timothy. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Thank you Chris. Welcome, Chris. Welcome, welcome, Hero. welcome, Timmy. Tim, thank you. Now, hey, I'm first. I want to say, Hi, I've been Tim. since our conversation off the air. Honorary son. Go ahead, by Gail. The way, I'm making you my son. I hope you're really. Mine. Well, he got a certificate okay. of sonship. Oh, oh yes, nice. please. Tim, there'll be <laughs> there'll be a certificate of sonship sent to you. Oh wow! He's doing what I did in medicine with the planet. So, I just love you. You must be related to me somehow. And we are somehow all. In the, in the, we're uh, kindred spirits. Yeah. Can you tell us about you? Tell us what you're doing, the exciting stuff that's happening. Sure. Thank you for having me on. Um, so my name Thank is you. Timothy Percival, and I am a full-time professional regenerative farmer and agricultural consultant who does a number of different things, but primarily two. One is that I build new agricultural systems from the ground up with organizations and institutions. And the second is that I work with existing farms to help improve and diversify their capacity or just improve efficiency. So we can talk about that in a number of ways. But what I would like to do is, is just mention a couple of different projects that I'm working on so that people can get a sense of what it is that I'm doing, and then we can extrapolate from that to a more general uh, paradigm and discuss some of the things that we're So one project uh, is that I am a conservation agriculture consultant with the Warren County Conservation District. So every county has a conservation district and a U.S. Department of Agriculture office that serves the entire county needs for soil and water conservation and agricultural um, distribution of policy measures and, and funds for the county agricultural system. What I do with the conservation district in Warren County, Kentucky is we are identifying as a, as a, as a matter of total county design, areas of food insecurity. And then we are, instead of trying to get food to those systems through other farms, we're trying to build farms right there. So we are working okay. with the Housing Authority of Bowling Green. The Warren County Conservation District uh, gave a grant of $25,000 a year to the Housing Authority's nonprofit organization for them to work with a professional consultant and a farm manager to build professional, productive, conservation-based agriculture systems right there at the Housing Authority. They have a 30-acre hay field that was inaccessible to the 600 um, residential communities that live there, residential houses and 1,100 residences, until we decided <laughs> into an agroforestry system of contour terraces, teaching the residents how to do land surveying, identifying how the water would passively fall, and then we built terraces and planted about 700 tree crops in a single day um, across the landscape, native tree crops and fruit and nut species. And then we have worked with 45 different residents families to build this five-acre community garden and agroforestry cooperative farm system that grows scores of different crops 
and then all of those crops go back to the residential communities, either through the farm families or through a mobile grocery bus that takes the excess produce from the farm system and delivers it at an extremely low cost to the residential community and other low-income communities in Foley. So that project works with the institution of the Housing Authority, the institution of the Warren County Conservation District, and then I helped write a through the Kentucky Department of Agriculture for specialty crop production so that it could support the expansion and sustainability long-term of the project. So now the Kentucky Department of Agriculture is also involved, and the federal government is taking notice through the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which have come four times now to view the farm. They've taken professional videography of the farm system. They've tried to identify how it works so that they can see how to make it into a model to work with other housing authorities and conservation districts around Kentucky and the United States. So that project, if we can extrapolate from that, instead of trying to just own land, but instead of, let's, let's take that 30 acre hay field and say I owned it. If I own it and I try to establish a privately owned, individually uh, farmed, uh, or farmed with myself under the ownership with a team of interns or whatever and tried to do it that way, I never would be able to achieve the institutional support that we have achieved by making it into an institutional farm. A privately right. owned small farm does not deserve the same amount of support system as a cooperatively managed, institutionally managed, integrated um, farm with city uh, county and state and even federal structures. So by building the farm system as an institutional farm system, we then are able to receive support from within the institution, the, the worker owners, so to speak, of the farm being the residents of the um, housing authority and other external institutional support systems of county and state and federal support. So instead of having the attitude of, I'm going to be this farmer that goes out and builds all these innovative organic systems for myself to then sell the agricultural products at a market, which is an extremely difficult way of trying to make a living and part of the reason why we have less than 1% of the nation farming professionally, instead of doing that, I'm looking at how do we build cooperative farm systems with our existing agricultural and political institutions? because it's through our institutions that change actually happens in society. Beautiful. Yeah, I want to say no, incredibly, not. incredibly beautiful. And also the changing face of food. You know, my, my son, Michael Brooks, the Michael Brooks show, he's all about policy. And I realized, God, you just filled in so many connections because I'm not in the, in the area that I'm in, in, in Western Mass and in Vermont. And I think, yeah, uh, with your honorable son listening, um, it's quite an economic game because, you know, I, if I go to Whole Foods, people will see me later in the day. They'll, they'll tell me, in the week, it's like they just can't afford it. And then some people, so it's quite a game because people, everyone knows that good food is good food. But a lot That's of people right. say to me on the side, say, I can't afford it. I can't afford that stuff. It's like, yes, I want to go have, I want to go have grass fed meat. I could do that once a month. But you are, you're making these links that I haven't heard before that are so, I mean, my son's going to be blown away because this is what he's so into. Like, what what creates policy? So, how do you implement a great idea like available food that's real, sustainable? And I, and I get I get why your mom is so excited, Dr. Gail Randall, about what you're up to because it's so it's the most integrative model and visionary model. I'm inspired deeply by it. Gail. What what's your take when, when Tim's sharing about this model? Well, what I see, and I'm sure he's seeing the same thing. First of all, he's creating a model for the whole state of Kentucky, right, Tim? Right. Well, I'm trying to do that, and I and, and we can right. talk more today about what we what we what we did today because we've been working with the, one of the candidates for commissioner of agriculture today, so we can get to that in a minute. Right. Right. Well, I'm. We're going to all pray for that, and I believe that's going to happen. And after that, it's. It's the it's the whole country, and then maybe the world. I mean, you know, this is a model that can be carried forward to help save our planet. That's what I'm seeing. I mean, and I just respect you so much for the work you're doing. And um, yeah, you, I want to know people in my area that we can contact and support 
and maybe we can get that from you, and then we can, and I know everybody in this team wants to know people in their area like you that we can support, and we can begin supporting that, because I've been telling my patients since day one, 40 years, I can't afford organic food. I say, you can't not afford organic food. Vote with mm-hmm. your dollar. And now you can go to Costco and buy massive amounts of, of organic food. Now, I know it's not the best, 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 like it will be when your model catches on, but it's better than what we had. It's better than yeah. when industrial right. farming took over in 1933, and that's when everything changed, Glenn. 1933, when the government in, started subsidizing industrial farming. That's when everything changed for the worst. But now, Timothy's going to incorporate them to change it back for the better. So basically, if we if we look at the developments of the 20th century in agriculture and in the demographic shift of society, what we saw was a dismantling of the rural farm economy and the family farm structure for a corporate consolidated farming system. And they took agricultural research because they were the ones primarily funding it, have research in land grant institutions, and they took the farmland as well. So that's how you end up with 88 million acres of soybeans, 88 million acres of corn, and 60 million acres of wheat across the United States annually, and a loss of the diversified family farm structure. When that happened... And how many million per- gallons of steak? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you just how much glyphosate is used in that, how much genetically engineering, you know, is used in that, all types of questions. Who owns the patent on the genetics, you know, tons, tons of questions with that. Uh, but if you look also at the demographic shift, 80% of the population moved to the urban center. So now you have the vast majority of the United States population living in urban and small rural communities surrounding urban centers, urban, suburban, small rural. And then the larger farm mm-hmm. systems are consolidated into basically industrial commodities, monocultures, soybeans, corn, and wheat. So what we're looking at now is that the fight against that has been the fight to save the family farm for the last two generations, but it's not working. The individuated family farm is not the real rival of the multinational corporation. It's not strong enough. It cannot organize with the same form of aggression. And it's, and it's, it's only run by an, an atomized group of people, an individual farm of inheritance structures, or at best, a small collection of private family farms coming together. So mm-hmm. instead of just trying to fight for that, not say that we shouldn't, but instead of only trying to do that, Let's look now at where we are in the 21st century. Now that we have 80% of the population living in urban and and suburban and small rural centers, let's look at human history and see how have we done agriculture in the past. In the past, we haven't done it as individuated family units. We've always done agriculture in human societies as large collections of social groups that we're working together for a common cause to raise the fuel, fiber, and food system of the village or of the nation or whatever it is. So now, since we know that and since we have population centers, let's return agricultural systems to the place where people live. In the urban communities, let's rebuild, relaunch like a victory garden platform like we did during World War II. We could call it climate gardens or something like that today mm. to, to put it in the climate mm. change context, or we could put it in the context Love. of human health. You want to get, you don't want to get, you don't want to eat processed foods, then let's have in these incredible lawn to garden transformations, you know, that are feeding families again, right there on their own property. And that would Ken, open people up. Want me to, people want me to give out your, your, your contact. There's a lot of people are asking right now how they could be in touch and learn more about your work. So if you could be kind enough right. to All let right. people know sure. how they could be in touch on your website. Sure. So so right now I'm I'm working on launching a new website. But for right for this moment, and this is the way you're going to find out whatever it is I launch, look me up at Timothy Kirchville on Facebook. Timothy mm-hmm. Kirchville. K E R. C H E V I L L E. Okay, then 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 on Instagram you can find me at Festina Lente Farm. That's spelled F F E S 
P I N A L E N T E Farm F A R M S Festina Lente is Latin for haste slowly. And that's sort of a mantra that I use in attempting to build transformational systems for agriculture. So get in touch with me that way, right? Please ask me, we'll do some videos, and you'll find that on uh, my Instagram site, Dr. GM, I mean, Dr. Gail Randall, and also on Pledge for Planet on yes. Instagram. Yes. And then if people, w if people would like to email me, they can email me at t.kercheville, K-E-R-D-H-E-B-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E at gmail.com. So get in touch with me through one of those three means for now. And then, Tim, you'll, you'll get those names of those farmers, and we'll tell you the locations of these other circle members, Great. and then we'll be able to publish that as well for, Great. for our own you know, and promote them locally, each of us in our areas. Great. So can I, can I get back to what I was talking about with urban, suburban, please. small, rural, and large rural systems? Go ahead. Please. please. Okay. Please, please. So, so, like I was saying, in the urban centers where the vast majority of the population lives, we need to have a victory garden campaign. Lawn to garden transformations for fruit and vegetable explosion of production. Now, this is going to do a couple of different major things. It's going to give people access to whole foods right there and access to the soil and all the health that comes from that. But also, if you look at the farming economy, it's in it's the hardest thing in the world to try to figure out how to be a professional farmer today. That's why you have less than 1% of the nation doing it. But look at people like me around the nation who do have the skills of professional farmers. There is entrepreneurial opportunity for us to work with landowners to help teach them and their families and their communities how to build these agricultural systems to sustain them. So people can hire professional farmer educators to come in and help them transform their properties into basically permaculture designed systems where you have food and resilience. Explain energy what perma explain, Timothy, explain what permaculture is for people. Well, it's a really big subject. I might not have – I might – I don't want to lose people. I don't want to lose people. It happens people really, 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 is very hot. I just yeah. want to don't lose people. There's a lot of people at, at University of Massachusetts, they have a permaculture garden, but a lot of people aren't familiar, and I realize you're, you're, you're hitting upon such valuable stuff. I just want to have people not lose people in the yeah. conversation. Anybody, anybody on a panel that has a question for Timothy, because you know, to me, I, I learned this stuff. And in a very obscure way, like I, I read a book by a cardiologist who was explaining how heart disease changed when they started to pasteurize and homogenize milk. And I, I kept picking up parts of the story. And, of course, I always thought the, the local farm was the hero. But it was, it was sort of like, where, where's the organic farm? And then things kind of, I guess, changed again, and Whole Foods came on the scene. And so you're kind of – you know, you're, you're creating a sustainable – when you talk about the housing authority, a lot of people – uh, I know that I'm involved with the housing authority. A lot of them say to me, like, "Hey, we, you know, like going to, <laughs> like buying food is a big deal for them, and buying real food, they think it's a joke." So what you're talking when it. you line these things up is so beautiful. That's right. Yeah, it, that that helps alleviate the problem on two different ends because, for one, people that don't own farmland and don't have that type of equity of worth on their property ownership have a difficult mm -hmm. time in the economy being able to afford anything, but particularly whole foods, which are necessary for human health. So at the same time, farmers are struggling desperately to try to get fair prices for the sweat equity that they put into every single thing that they do. I mean, if you're a good farmer, you dream seasons in advance about the things you try to do. And then not only do you dream about it, but you actually go out and do it, and you sacrifice yourself the natural cycles and all other types of things in order to make it happen productively. So the farmer needs a, a proper return for sale, but the person that does not have access to the agricultural economy and wealth needs to be able to receive healthy food systems. How do you solve that problem? You solve the problem by building the farms right there where the people are. 
and getting them involved. And you do that through giving money through the institutional structures of society. Look, all of our agriculture, there are agricultural systems do not run on a free market economy. Nobody goes out and farms 10,000 acres in soybeans on their own dime. Nobody does that. Mm-hmm. People do that because the federal government in the farm bill passes legislation that gives insurance on and subsidies for all of those systems. They're paid for. So without them being paid for, it doesn't happen. So why should all the small-scale diversified farmers and why should all the people who don't have farmland and access to the agricultural economy have to perform these heroic feats of rugged individualism in order to build some type of just, uh, you know, and sustainable whole food economy. They shouldn't have to. We have plenty of money in every single state and in every single county to develop these institutionally integrated agricultural cooperative systems. So mm-hmm. first step is first step is victory gardens in the urban centers. Second step in the urban centers is to work with all institutions to, through their own support mechanisms, schools, jails, housing authorities, international centers, nonprofit organizations, music and art organizations, universities, churches, everything. All of them have their own support systems, and all of them have to pay for their own land management, but it's mostly in lawn culture. So if we just Great. change that lawn culture to productive agroforestry diversified farm systems, we're doing permaculture. Because what permaculture is, is resilient, energy efficient, agriculturally productive, ecologically sound life systems, including agricultural systems, right in human habitation. And in order to do permaculture effectively, we cannot be individual atoms of heroes trying to rebuild entire, you know, social systems from our own private properties. We have to work with the right. institutional structures of society in order to make real change. So those are the first two steps in the say, high demographic areas. Then you are in the Stephen second, Hawking's re- of farm reform. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> so then, and then your mom's so your mom's so proud of you, Timothy. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say. I, I, uh, you may be Gail's adopted son, but I'd love for you to be my adopted brother. You know, I, your message is <laughs> wow. so profound and so powerful. Mm. I love uh, it. It really moves mm. my heart. Mm. I'm trying to figure mm. out how we could live stream you and uh, start doing classes and bringing those, you know, what you're doing into each state, you know, or in, even into the schools, you know, teaching right. the kids at the grassroots level and can really put together the minds that they are. Can do. Yes. We can do that right now. We can start that. And Timothy, I want I want you to speak at our, our upcoming event with Dr. Gail and Lisa, and Dr. Gloria, and uh, Sherry. So I have an event coming up in Vermont. By the way, in Vermont, the Fresh Food Network is an association of chefs and farmers who really care about the land and making food accessible. You know, yeah. I, I, as I'm as I'm listening to you, my experience of food was there was no food at my school, so I went to the cafeteria. And other than getting shaken down for change at the vending machine, which wasn't an unpleasant, and then the the bathroom had a, a it was a cigarette apparently a, a cigarette uh, meeting place. I would go to the local farm stand for lunch, and I thought, oh my god, it was so different. Talking, it was such a different experience. It 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 connected me. And as you're speaking, I realized what happened. And this is the, in the days where there was a local independent health food store, and you know you knew you were going to pay a lot more money, but once you got turned on. You know, I was with Dick Gregory, I was with Dick Gregory, the political activist, one year, and he said, pretty soon what's going to happen is you guys are able to buy all your bottled water at $500 a bottle. And he goes, well, what about the people next to you? See, early on, it was kind of like, well, you've got to be affluent to live this way. But, and I agree with Dr. Gale. The visionary part of what you're doing, it's, it's so congruent and, um, and, and applicable to bring this into our culture in a way that's sustainable and connected. I mean, it's, a, it's an everyone for the planet message. I know that you guys want to go to yeah. Dr. Gill's website. Is it for the planet, pledge for the planet? I might pledge have chopped the planet. name. Thank you. I, I, I'm see, warming up to the name and embracing it in my soul. Pledge for planet. And we're going to get Timothy on. We're going to get uh, four oceans and ocean tech. You know, the oceans are as important as the land. But I just uh, i am so thrilled with having Tim- Timothy Kirchville with us today. I'm just uh, makes my heart sing. 
What happens right now? Yeah, Lisa's Nebraska. right here. She's in. She's. I want to ask this Nebraska, one question. Yeah, I wanna... When I grew up, that old. We used to have a farmer living next door to us where the cows would run around and the chickens ran with the cows. And then when industrialized farm, Chicken ran with the cows. That is a film in the making. We're going to take a brief pause. We're going to continue on this wonderful in-depth conversation about food, farming, and transforming the land and making food accessible with Dr. Gail Reynolds and our team on the Vibrant Living Team. I'm Glenn Brooks. Your life's precious. Enjoy it. Stay with us. Feed your soul with waves of consciousness on Ohm Times Radio. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. I'm Kathy Williams, host of Sexy Mom Abundant Life radio show on Thursdays at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. On the show, we explore living abundantly in every area of your life. Ways to let go of limiting patterns and beliefs and to step into the flow of creativity and possibility, knowing you are supported by the universe. Hi, we're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that our daughters have what they need to grow and learn. But that isn't the case for nearly 13 million kids in the U.S. that struggle with hunger. Childhood hunger is a heartbreaking reality that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and provides it to families and children in need. You can help kids in need in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Hello, I'm Glenn Brooks, listening to the Vibrant Living Network. What feeds us and how we can have access to food, what changes the soil? It's an, it's an opportunity not just to re-examine it, but to implement it with uh, Timothy Kurtzville. He's going to give us information again. You Doctor, you got mail. That's a good invitation. I like how you did that. Dr. Gail Reynolds with us on the panel here. Food is, in our own sense, you know, Gail, I think the thing is, is that you started as a physician really, really understanding food is medicine. And you know what keeps touching me about you is you really want to make this stuff accessible and real. So it's not just one group of people that always has this access. It's really more people that have access to something so we can enjoy the planet together and sort of gives us, gives people inspiration. I mean, this is it's kind of profound inspiration what Timothy's talking about. Lisa, I'm glad you brought up something, Gloria. I want to have a panel. If you guys have a question that's burning, please ask it because we're covering such deep ground. And Timothy, I'm, I'm excited to set up dates with you at our next our next summit, our next uh, speaker summit, and everything I can do to get this message out to our million people, including you writing an article a caller, once a month. Like... I want to invite you to write an article. Do a caller? On a regular basis. Do we have a caller? Call the caller? Oh, I thought you said we had mail. No, no, it was, it was another person's uh, mailbox. Uh, I don't do the imitation as good as that. Okay. I, I have, oh, thanks, Chris. We need more lines. We need We're going to get more lines. Yeah. yeah. May I ask my question? Please, Gloria. Thank Please, you. Dr. Dr. Gloria. Yes. So, um, excuse me, Tim. That was absolutely stunning. I love your concept. Uh, I also want to tell you, I was very impressed recently with the film that I saw about traditional farming called uh, mm -hmm. Biggest Little Farm. Are you familiar with that, that film? Did uh, you love what it? Type of, what type of traditional farming? No, uh, we, uh, we just, talked about it, Tim. Biggest Little Farm. Oh, yeah. I, movie. I really need, I need to see it. I have not seen it, but... A lot of people are harping on me to see it. I just had a friend from the Netherlands reach out to me last night. She was saying, have you seen this yet? She just saw it. I said, no, I haven't. She's like, what are you doing? How can you even be a farmer in America and not watch this? Kind <laughs> <So>, of. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm sorry. I want to tell you my personal, um, uh, evaluation of it. First of all, I'm a film studies, uh, student. So 
film is very, very important to me. And I was privy to meet the director, who was also the mm. filmmaker. He had been a professional filmmaker. Now, the land wow. that they bought is very close to Santa Barbara. It's in an area called Moor Park. Right. And the right. film... The film the film starts showing uh, the fires that we've had here and the devastation. So right. we track the, or the film tracks the entire evolution of this farm. And in the end, it's a profitable uh, endeavor for the family. But I was so touched by the way it was done and the way they treat the animals. They had a pig there that had two litters, and you could see the filmmaker uh, assisting the pig with the deliveries, and I think they had like 13 piglets the first time around. Mm -hmm. It was really, yeah. really, really well done. So, you know, this is on a much larger It was larger super scale well shot, it. wasn't it, Gloria? Yeah, yeah, it was. And here, Beautifully this was an interesting. It, this was an interesting aside. So I I met the filmmaker uh, because he was doing a Q&A, at this particular presentation. And this is quite funny. He had a plaid shirt on and a baseball cap, and it was, you know, a packed audience. <laughs> and when he wanted to enter, you know, to, to uh, he, when he wanted to enter the theater, they turned him away and they said, no, <laughs> it's a full house. <laughs> but then he said, I'm the filmmaker, so of course they let him in. But what an unassuming time, man. It was just amazing. So this is not what yeah. you're trying to do, Tim. I mean, what you're trying to do, I think, is remarkable, absolutely remarkable, to bring back the yeah, Victory Garden. Yeah, it leagues ahead. Beautiful but it, it, idea. that was such you, a beautiful Yeah. It was. Yeah. Now, well, I that's used to, just, go ahead. I used to live in uh, Carpinteria, and now I'm back in Santa Barbara. I've been a resident here for over 35 years. But in Carpinteria... There is a community plot right near the train station that's well tended, and also we have community garden gardens here that are you know larger than what you would have in your backyard at the Victory Garden. Yeah. But anyway, community communities are bonding, and they know there's a need for this high quality organic food, and they're producing it. So I honor you and your attempts, and this concept is just amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So we, yeah, basically, we can tie back into that uh, Biggest Little Farm story. Uh, although I have not seen it, nevertheless, it, it fits in well with the second stage of, of agricultural development that we need to see. That farm is a, is a great example of a small rural farm that is, that uh, that we need to support again. So, in what I've shared so far was basically the plan for urban centers. But the small yes. rural farms, we need to support these farms in diversified agroforestry systems, where you have multiple different types of profit streams and agricultural production lines. The integration of ethically, uh, ecologically managed animal husbandry with organic and biodynamic uh, polycultural plant-based agriculture and perennial agriculture in tree crops uh, is, is a great foundation for agricultural, or excuse me, for agroforestry and silvopasture systems in the small rural farmland. Those surrounding urban centers plus the interchange between the urban agricultural economy can bring a, an, a very exciting economic urban-rural exchange of a whole food and even somewhat of a fuel and fiber economy, just right there by redesigning ecologically balanced, socially integrated, economically integrated agroforestry systems for urban and small rural communities that are institutionally supported through county structures of Natural Resource Conservation Service, USDA, and the Cooperative Extension through your state departments of agriculture. Then in the larger in the larger rural farmland, now we're talking about like the great Midwest farm, 10,000 acres of soybeans and corn. We need to transition away from the subsidies and crop insurance programs 
for those types of farming systems because we're funding them at a tremendous loss. And it's not just an economic loss. Those commodity prices are falling out right now. And with all types of trade imbalances and trade wars now, even worse. But we haven't been making money off of those systems for five to seven years already, and it's been getting worse and worse in the last generation. They're also econ ecologically totally disastrous, environmentally disastrous. We now have a dead zone of chemical runoff at the base of the, uh, of the Mississippi River Delta in the Gulf of Mexico that is the size of uh, Rhode Island, where life does not oh occur God. from heavy nitrogen and phosphorus runoff. This is totally unacceptable. So not only that, but across the large rural farmland, when we have these large industrial monocultures, when rain falls like it did this spring throughout the Midwest with heavy rain, you do not have diversified deep taproot structures for the water to infiltrate through deep soil organic matter like the former prairie and savanna grassland ecosystems that once thrived across these places. We must return to grassland, savanna, prairie ecosystems across these larger scale agricultural systems. And the way that we do that is, again, by partnering with institutions. We have conservation institutions like the Nature Conservancy, and we have organizations, nonprofit organizations, like in the Southeast, we have the Southeast Grassland Initiative, which is trying to restore and protect native grassland, savanna, prairie ecologies throughout the Southeast. So you work with them to identify ways to restore ecological biodiversity on the larger rural farmland outside the urban centers, but then make it agriculturally productive by including regenerative grazing systems like you probably saw a little bit of in. Go ahead, Tim. Tim, it's okay. You can go ahead. You can keep keep rolling. Tim, Tim, Tim. Maybe his phone cut out. Bill, you there? Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. We lost him. Okay, he'll come right back. He'll come right back. You know, I just want to. I was a lot of people. Oh, Tim, we you you. you oh, okay, cool. Okay, okay, you're there. You're 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 there, Tim. You're there. Hey, Tim, I just want okay. to say a lot of people now are asking me about your comments before you leave, your comments about uh, food co-ops and what could they do today. You're inspiring a lot of proactive action. I'm also, as, as we speak, I'm looking to collaborate with some publications that are food-based food based to really, to, to, I guess, to spread and, and deepen this, to, to really create this conversation into action, to have a path of action. First, if you could, at the end of your comments, if you could mention food co-ops Anything you think people could do at their local governmental or state or town level? Yes. You need to identify who the professionals are. Who are the skillful farmer educators in your community? Go to those people. I guarantee you they're struggling. They're, tr they're desperately trying to make a living by selling all kinds of products. They're overproducing, things like that, and they're desperately trying to make enough money off sales. Work with them to find some institution, whether it's a school garden or to work with their housing authority or their conservation district, whatever institution you can get, to pay them to create a new farm system and educate a local community. Work with them. Identify who they are. And then go to your school systems and say, hey, look, let's try to write a grant together for a few thousand dollars to build a school garden. Let's have Farmer Jane Farmer Joe, whatever, Abigail, whatever her, her his name is, let's have them work mm -hmm. with us and build this for this amount of money that we can get through the grant. And let's apply as a school so that we have a likelihood of getting the grant. Then let's build it. And as soon as we start building it, let's identify the long-term sustainability plan for how to sustain it once Farmer Abigail or Farmer Joe is gone. So when you do that, you help build another type of way for the farmer educator to make a living than just by breaking themselves over and over again, trying to make enough crops or sell enough meat or whatever it is in order to make their living. You help diversify their, their own way of living at the same time as you build an education system at your institutional structure. People are asking me if we could do something on a regular basis along with Dr. Gale and the team that allows 
people to build a community conversation, a conversation with you, Tim, so that we could take this to a path of action. So we want to, we want to do something on a regular basis with you. We're very moved and feel inspired that this is available. I think there's so many people out there that I know echo and are deeply moved by what you're saying, but don't know where to begin. They have a right. sense of the problem, but don't know, know what, don't want to know where to implement it. Right. Well, you've just got to start from somewhere, and the somewhere is identifying the people in your community who are already working for these things. Maybe they don't see that they – a lot of farmers can't see past the land they own. They just look at the soil that they own and think, i got to make it agriculturally productive. But farmer educators, people who can teach other people how to farm, have much greater market value than just the worth of kale sold at the marketplace or the worth of a whole chicken sold at the marketplace. The education that they can bring to the wider community is worth infinitely more than that. And, and, and everybody has money to manage land systems. Every school spends thousands of dollars on their land management. They just pay people to spray glyphosate on their fence rows and mow their lawns. So pay them instead to do contour terracing of a stormwater drain and build organic matter with the student body and have an outdoor education program where you're actually paying the farmer to come there, and now they're not just making money off of kale at the marketplace or whole chicken at the marketplace. Now they're also doing that with your community, and 600 students are getting educated at the same time. And some teacher who's passionate about it is taking it on as a matter of the professional institutional employee for the long-term sustainability of the project. Start there. I'd like, I'd like to see what you're saying. I'd like to see what you're saying. It's valuable. The idea of virus that we're not supposed to eat gluten, I'd like to see replaced, or at least, you know, when Dr. Guthrie came out and wrote The Plant Paradox, I thought one of the strongest points he made in the book is that gluten wasn't the problem. The problem was, was Roundup and chemicals. And so he was beginning to point at something that was bigger and more ingrained like in our whole food system. And it seems somehow, even, even car tires now have gluten-free on it. It seemed like that message became so, in a sense, it distracted from the message you have, which is really the authentic message, or the message that is so grassroots. You know what I mean? It just seems like, again, I'd love to get your comment on this, too. Obviously, it's not the gluten so much. A lot of people are questioning, is it an example of the quality of fermented foods? And that organic, organic grains, is an example, changes the equation in the whole gluten game anyway. And so a lot of people are they're so up about gluten, but I think they're missing this bigger conversation and what we can do about it. I don't want to well, get into gluten right now. I have a whole bunch of opinions about it, but I want to get back to Tim and ask him, okay, so you've got a really good plan. you got a really good plan. But we have to wait for your book. How are we going to getting this to educate them? Is there some book reference, or is it, or we have to wait, wait for your manual? Or uh, yeah. Is an um, educational well, uh, yeah, I am. I do need to. I need. I do need to put this into writing so that it can be distributed and so that. Uh, there, yeah, I really do. Tim, Tim, we have a I, we have a team of writers. I'd be I'd be glad to help you get the book into print. Okay, great. And we could also something okay. that, start with a manual, like a booklet for sure educational. You know, the the, the sure. little night of sleep just throughout about making it. Has got a yeah. big problem with their schools. They just had a big fight with, you know, no glyphosate, and a lot of kids got sick. And you know, now there's even more money available, and everybody's kind of hyper uh, awakened to it. So if they had something they could, you know, put their hands on to implement, they would. You know. Yeah. So, uh, so we need to talk more about that offline. But um, yeah, that's let's let's so help you get stuff in print. Brilliant. Let's I, let's help you. Let's let. Let's let's be there for get your number. We have writers. Love to help you with that. Great. Let's do it. Please. Okay. All right. All right. You want to? Would you go back to Lisa? Lisa, you have a. I want Lisa. You represent the audience. What's bubbling? What did? What didn't we ask Tim? What do you feel like? Share. What's tell? Tell me something right now that's bubbling. You live in Pittsburgh. You're in the in, in this. You're in the city there. Like what's what's? I know you're deeply inspired, Lisa. Is there something else you want to run by Tim before? That might be the audience might be thinking about, but you you know you want you have you have your finger on it. What would it be? We know 
Tim, there's so much, so much in your language that I think, um, you know, when you talk about agroforestry, I'd love to, for you to, for people that are not in grain and farming or some of the, the other terms, if you could just quickly explain, um, you know, why, why it is important and what that, that means to a, to a community. Yes. Thank yes. you, Lisa. Okay. So, and the plant agroforestry. Yeah. So, okay. So, agroforestry is a very efficient and ecologically robust way of building agricultural systems in mimicry of natural. Let's look at the way nature works. Look at, look at, now let's, let's, let's think about humid environment. Look at a forest. You see the top canopy, then you see the middle story trees. Then you see the understory trees. Then you see the grassland, the wildflowers, the root systems. We want to build agricultural systems that mimic that multi-layered canopy process. So instead of just growing rows upon rows of cabbage, instead of doing that, let's grow cabbage with cilantro and beside it, and then the trees with mulberry trees cover crop of buckwheat and cow peas with portable fencing with chickens moving through that system and duck. As the trees slowly grow, they build a perennial agriculture system that's going to be the basis of a system that you don't need to replant every year in the future. And it's going to provide nuts and it's going to provide timber, fuel, and then it's also going to provide feed for your animals. And at the same time, while you're waiting for the forestry system to develop, you're immediately cropping fast maturing polyculture annuals like your garden tomatoes, beans, all the garden plants that you can think of. Wow. That's Beautiful. agroforestry. Well, thank you. You know, and it's so such simple wisdom. And, and I know that uh, Gail is a, a doctor of functional medicine. It's the same way the, the body works. You know, instead of looking at the symptom, you know, treat the whole system. And, and I think it's such a powerful and important message. And thank you so much for sharing that, Tim. Well, thank you. Looking forward to continuing the conversation. Absolutely, Tim. Absolutely. I'm just so I'm sitting I'm on a lot of states I'm walking on a straight forest right now on a beautiful piece of property the water treatment plant here has been turned into a green it's functioning in a green way and it's it's so um, powerful to see people implement change at the level of food because it's so fundamental it so impacts our everyday life and um, you know uh, God, it's just, I'm so inspired you know Gail I just love the true holism of your of your medicinal medical global vision and how it relates to the individual, the family, and the planet. It's just, it's very, uh, I mean, that, uh, Gail, Lil, Lily, Tim, Gail's heart sings when she, when she, when she introduced me to you. And this is after like 27 years ago when I introduced, I introduced Sally Fallon to the public when she started grassroots whole food groups around the country. But it was, it still wasn't comprehensive. You had a little, you had this farm there and that farm here. I've never had anybody speak about how to go to the institutions and make this thing truly powerful in one thing and bring people together. You have a very, it's almost like there's a political implication here of people coming together to do something so wonderful and powerful and change policy. There is a political implication to it. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. because one day we're going to win a Department of Agriculture in a state that's going to use its multiple million dollar budget to start funding these things at an integrated level across the whole Commonwealth. I'm going to do everything I can to get you on my. I'm going to I'm going to see what I can do to get you on my son's show, and he's got a big show, many many thousands of listeners and viewers, and he's to the heart of policy. And I realize what you're talking about is so to the heart of what people could do and access these funds. I mean, these funds are there. I guess they just haven't been, they haven't been properly allotted for, the, for this use. Is that true? That's so a lot Correct. of these funds are that's there, exactly but they're not, right. yeah, that's amazing. Oh. That's exactly right. Wow. In Kentucky, the agricultural economy is a $5.5 billion annual industry, $5.5 billion. Wow. And the Kentucky oh. Department of Agriculture has a $36 million annual appropriation for 2020. But the average annual net farm income is $11,543. Yes. You try there to make a living go. off oh of that. Right. There you so go. something has to change. 
And the way to change it is not only to fight for the family farm. That's a part of it, but it's right. not the whole thing. You have to fight for cooperative, institutionally integrated agricultural systems designed for the demographic shifts of the 21st century. Exactly. And you need to teach us how to do that. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And I, I want well, to I I think... know what president <laughs> – go ahead, Lisa. I was going to say, I think Mother Nature is assisting because of the uh, – with the flooding – that's going on, and I mean, yeah. we've had so much soil erosion, trees, beautiful, you know, 100-year-old trees coming down yeah. uh, all over the city in Pennsylvania. I just, uh, yeah, and, and I think like, so people are, are right attention. to listen and want to listen. Need you to lead Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> please do. <laughs> Your mother's for you. Is there any presidential candidate, and, and, and as we watch the Democratic debates, and I know my son is at every debate now, is there any candidate that's speaking agriculturally in the, in the, in the language you're using about funding and policy? Is there anyone speaking about that? Uh, not as much as I'd like to see, but I will say that the, um, the team for Bernie Sanders has reached out to me recently while they're campaigning really? in Iowa. And they're trying to build – they have built a very robust agricultural and rural economic agenda. It's very good. Mm -hmm. If you read Bernie Sanders' rural economic revitalization or rural economic agricultural agenda, read it, Google yes. it. It's very, very, it's very, very, very strong. It talks about regenerative okay. agricultural <laughs> solutions. It talks really? about breaking up huge um, corporate consolidated systems. And support. It, it, it goes back to supporting family farm systems. But it doesn't build the language of institutionally integrated cooperative agricultural systems like I'm yeah. talking about. There's nobody yeah, that's really do. doing that. But the best that we have right now on the national scale is what Bernie is saying. Tulsi Gabbard is also talking about regenerative and organic agricultural solutions, but she's not really getting specific. And Tim Ryan mm -hmm. is talking about regenerative agriculture, and he wrote a book five years ago on rebuilding our agricultural system to support a whole food economy. So he's probably the one that has done the most work, and I know that he knows a lot of farmers in the regenerative agriculture movement, but I also know that all of those farmers he's talking to are private landowners that are trying to work for their family farm, and they're not thinking about institutional integration. So nobody's really talking about that as much as they should be yet, but it's going to be mm -hmm. the next conversation that we have. We're changing that. We're going to change the conversation with you. Thank you. Absolutely. We, yeah, you're well, you. deeply welcome. Well, once again, go ahead, Timmy, get, give out your – please give out your contact so that people can uh, yeah. engage you, write to you. Yeah. Right. Okay, so uh, find me on Facebook at Timothy Kercheville, K-E-R-C-H-E, B as in village, I-L-L-E. Now, are you going to make this ceremony being the honorable son of Dr. Gail Randall public or private? Because I like to come to the ceremony. <laughs> well, I'll have to talk to my parents about that. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> oh, All right, we'll speak to the folks. Soon. Everything will be honorable. Good, good. It sounds well, good. I, hey, I, first of all, I want to thank, I want to thank Gail. I want to thank Gail for being uh, – I just love her to pieces. She's – She's, I don't know, it's its hard to say, but she's been such a contribution beyond a family member and just a visionary herself. And she's, she really, uh, God, Tim, she just has been so um, moved deeply about your message and bringing it to another level. And we will. We will. And we have many, many people. We have, we have, we have hundreds of thousands of people. And this is it. You're, you're with us. So welcome to the Vibrant Living family. Always welcome. Hey, you like hey, precious and joy. So thanks for, be thanks for being with us. And All thanks all right, the time you. to being our partner here at Vibrant Living Network. Thank you, Chris, and everyone there. I'm Glenn Brooks. Thanks again, and blessings. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lisa. Bye-bye.